In part two of our drug-resistant TB series, we will focus on the latest recommended regimens for patients with roof resistant TB with likely or confirmed fluoroquinolone susceptible bacilli. We will describe the latest regimen choices as outlined in the rifampicin resistant clinical guide that was released by the National Department of Health in November of 2019. See part one of this series for a short overview of the diagnosis and classification as well as the WHO grouping of the newest DRTB drugs available. But let's get started with this Yandisa tutorial. There are broadly two scenarios where we'll be considering a fluoroquinolone sensitive regimen. The first is the patient with confirmed gene expert positive, roof resistant TB, but no available LPA yet. The second is a patient where we have an LPA result available showing that roof resistance, but confirming that the fluoroquinolones are sensitive. To choose the best regimen for your fluoroquinolone sensitive patient, you have to consider the following three questions. Firstly, how sure you are that the fluoroquinolone is definitely sensitive. If you have reasons to suspect there may be fluoroquinolone resistance, you would not use one of the MDR-TB regimens. Secondly, you have to consider the clinical condition of your patient. Does the patient have extra pulmonary TB or perhaps extensive lung damage? You can only use the short MDR-TB regimen in patients who are relatively well. And thirdly, you want to take a good history about any previous exposure to DRTB second-line drugs. For example, has the patient relapsed or is this someone that you are restarting um, after loss to follow up? In those patients, we will always use the longer regimen. Armed with this information, you can now choose which of the MDR-TB regimens you will be using the short regimen or the long basic regimen. The short regimen is reserved for uncomplicated well patients. The patient will usually have RRTB or if they have MDRTB it will be only with one mutation. There will be new patients with no significant exposure to second line drugs. Clinically they must be well, no extra pulmonary TB, no extensive lung disease and they all must be over six years of age. Note that the short regimen can also be used in pregnant women if the above criteria are met. But pretty much everyone that does not fit into that category will receive what is called the basic long regimen. So that will include your slightly more complicated resistance patterns, so for example your MDR-TB with dual mutation, and those patients who are injectable resistant but still fluoroquinolone sensitive. These patients we used to classify as pre-XDR, um, with assumed multiple resistance drugs, but we are going to be using an MDR-TB regimen because the fluoroquinolone is still sensitive. You will also use the long basic regimen in patients who have previously been exposed to second-line drugs. For example, the patient has relapsed or restarted after a loss to follow-up, and also our clinically ill patients, those ones with extra pulmonary TB and extensive lung disease. Note that we no longer use the short regimen in children under six years of age. They will all get the longer basic MDR-TB regimen if they qualify. So just remember that not every RR patient qualifies and patients who are fluoroquinolone resistant or have failed or with possible or confirmed resistance to bedaquiline, clofazamine and linezolid are going to need much more specialized regimens. Due to not all the new drugs crossing the blood-brain barrier, there's also a special regimen for tuberculosis meningitis. But let us start off with the MDR-TB short regimen. Remember this is for our straightforward new patients, both adults and also children from the age of six and up. At first it might seem quite overwhelming with seven drugs early on in the treatment and different drugs stopped at different times. The continuation phase consists of four drugs giving a total of a nine to eleven month regimen but let's just look a little bit closer at these seven initial drugs. Our backbone is made up of our three Group A drugs. Remember the Mercedes Benzes of our treatment choices. That is Bedaquiline, uh, Levofloxacin, and Linezolid. Added to these are our least toxic Group B drug, our Toyotas, and for this regimen we have chosen Clofazamine. And the last three we're actually very familiar with as our classic first-line TB drugs. They are our Tatas, not so good as the others, um, and are there for a little bit of extra boosting. That's our high-dose INH, our PZA, and our Ethambutol. The continuation phase consists of four drugs, Levofloxacin, Clofazamine, PZA, and Ethambutol. 
Let's go through each of them in a little bit more detail and see which ones are stopped when. So firstly, our linezolid is only added for the first two months. Remember to watch that HB and if it drops to admit for transfusion. We try and keep linezolid in this regimen for that first two months at all costs. Secondly, that high dose INH will be stopped at four months if the patient is smear negative at this point. Bedaquiline, as you know, is a set six month course still and it starts off with 400 milligrams a day for two weeks and then reduced to 200 milligrams Monday, Wednesday, Fridays for a further 22 weeks. It can increase the QT interval and so the ECG must be monitored carefully. Levaflox will be given for the full nine months and is the preferred option whilst the patient is on bedaquiline, a bit more QT friendly than that moxifloxacin. So when you complete the bedaquiline, you can switch the levoflox to moxiflox. Flufazamine has to be given for the full nine months. And lastly, PZA and ethambutol are also given for the full duration, but if either of them cause any adverse events, one could easily be discontinued without having to be replaced. But if both has to be discontinued, it would be important to extend some of the other drugs like linezolid or bedaquiline. I've added this slide, which is actually a bit of repetition, but it gives a nice visual picture of how these drugs get stopped in sequence. So you can see there linezolid is completing at two months, INH at four months, bedaquiline at six months, unless it needs to be extended, for example, for our late converters, and then that levoflox, glufazamine, PZA, and ethambutol are given throughout. Excellent. So let us move on to our basic long regimen. Again, this regimen is for both adults and children over six years, and a modified version is used in children under six years old. Remember, these patients must be fluoroquinolone sensitive, so RIF resistant or MDR-TB patients, but they might have more complicated resistance patterns, or they might be very ill, or they might have been exposed to MDR-TB drugs in the past. The basic long regimen, although longer, is much simpler. The intensive phase is made up of those three group A drugs, our Mercedes-Benz drugs, bedaquiline, levoflox and lezolid, as well as the two group B drugs, our Toyotas, glufazamine and terizidone, and those five drugs are given for the full six months. If the patient is culture negative by the time they get to month six, they can be moved to a 12-month continuation phase of levoflox, glufazamine and terizidone, with the bedaquiline and linezolid completing after the six months. And let's look a little bit more detail at those, at those drugs. So the bedaquiline again is a standard six month course, but it can be extended in patients who are not culture negative um, by four months. Linezolid is given with the bedaquiline for the full six months, so remember to keep an eye on that hemoglobin. Levoflox, key, key, key drug in this regimen and used with the bedaquiline again due to that possible increase of the QT interval um, and can be changed to moxifloxacin in the continuation phase. Terizidone and clofazidone are both given for the full 18 months. Um, and just a, a quick uh, sentence on each of their major side effects. So terizidone's biggest problem is peripheral neuropathy, um, and which is helped by also having the patient on some pyridoxin. Um, but clofazamine can give an orange hue in light-skinned patients and darkening of our skin in African patients, um, which can be unpleasant. So we don't have quite so many drugs in our long regimen, and therefore we have to make sure to substitute appropriately if any of them are not usable. Um, so let's just quickly look at terizidone. So terizidone is not a very important drug um, in the intensive phase and plays a bigger role in the continuation phase. So if in the intensive phase you are unable to um, tolerate the terizidone, it can actually be omitted without any worries, as long as you're sure that the other four drugs are, are all active. It's a bit more tricky in the continuation phase as we only have those three active drugs. Um, and so if you have to omit your terizidone during the last year, you're going to extend your linezolid or bedaquiline to give the drug, the regimen, a bit of extra support. Much more problematic is omitting linezolid, which is a key drug in that first six months. If the HP drops under eight, it will be necessary to admit the patient and one might even have to transfuse. If linezolid has to be replaced, one can use delaminate, um, or if delaminate is not available, you have to replace it with at least two um, active group C drugs.
So just a last couple of recommendations on both our MDR-TB regimens. Always remember to add pyridoxin to your regimen. Um, but the new guidelines are very clear that only 50 to 100 milligram may be given as higher dosages are also associated with peripheral neuropathy. It's also interesting to note that pyridoxin is useful for terizidone and INH-induced peripheral neuropathy, but not for linezolid. And secondly, our threshold for concern for both our regimens is month four. So at this point, we expect our patient to be smear and culture negative. If the culture at this point is still positive, you need to request an extended DST through the NHLS. Uh, there's a very nice clear SOP in the guide, and you also need to do an x-ray on your patient. Discuss with your local center of excellence about possible admission and at which point you want to do look at a rescue regimen. Well done, you are now able to prescribe an appropriate regimen for your patient with rif resistant TB who is furoquinolone sensitive. See part three of this series on how to manage the patient who has RRTB and is HIV positive.